Today we get into the second to last 1 Samuel message before we shift to Advent, before we look toward the holidays and Christmas, before then as we dive into a new year, we'll get back to the back half of this book of the Bible, but we'll take a break from it. So we're finishing up with this portion of the story that focuses primarily on Saul. We see that God was a king to his people. Just as we celebrate God as Father, we also look to God as our king. And most of us were raised in America. We don't necessarily think of, you know, we don't think of king in the same way maybe over across, across the pond, you know, king or queen and country, that you have a monarch. But God was the monarch to his people. God was the more than president to his people. And he would raise up judges in the Old Testament, we see, when they needed it. They didn't have an earthly king, they'd raise up judges. And that was the way he was working with his people. But the people looking around at the world, they wanted to mirror that. They wanted a king, they demanded a king. And so he said, okay, be careful what you wish for. He gives them Saul, who had already shown a lack of deference to God, a lack of ability with God's people then begins to turn up. In fact, it's told that he's going to be an oppressive kind of human king. God tells his people through Samuel, you've chosen poorly. And then when Saul makes some of his first mistakes, he tells, Saul is told, you've chosen poorly, your dynasty will not last. And so what God's doing is he's teaching his people through their circumstances, allowing them to move through less than optimal circumstances, allowing their folly and Saul's folly to carry them into situations. He's like, these are all going to be learning lessons for you. Giving them what they ask for while also admonishing them and foreshadowing his true and perfect provision that will be coming. And so as we get into our message today, how many of you found little pieces of candy on your seats when you came in? How many of you already partook of said candy? All right. Well, little did you know, since you were not here when another group of us was here praying together a little bit earlier, I said as pastor, no one should eat the candy until after service. <laughs> so some of you have ignorantly been disobedient. And I did that. You'll see how that ties into the passage and how you needn't be ashamed. Chapters 13 and 15, last week and next week, focus very much on Saul. But this chapter 14 really then switches to Saul's son, and we get this focus on Jonathan, and the contrast is really important. We see in this idea of sweetness, we see a true and sweet faith, and we also see a rather sour relationship. And we're going to see a stark contrast between the two. So we're going to move swiftly through 1 Samuel 14, because it's, it's a swift chapter with a lot of action. But we're going to see... This contrast. I invite you to pray with me as we ask for God to bless the reading of His Word. I thank you for your Scripture, our ability to learn from it. Thank you that you are a good Father. And as we look at Jonathan, we see his reliance on you, even though his earthly father is less than admirable. Thank you that we can still understand what it's like to be loved by a father, no matter our circumstances with our earthly ones. We thank you for the parents, father and mother, we are bore witness to today, looking to live under your counsel and raise their child with that image of you. And God, let us learn from this passage where we see a son actually outshine the father with his understanding of you in your name. Amen. Amen. It says in 14, One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah, in the pomegranate cave in Migrim. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Senna. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Gipa. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, 
Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place. And we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand. And this shall be the sign for us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. The men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come on up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor-bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor-bearer killed them after him. And that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor-bearer made, killed about twenty men within, as it were half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked and became a very great panic. Now, the first thing we see in this chapter is a real sharp look at Jonathan's faith. We see Jonathan has an amazing amount of faith. Perhaps God will provide, he says. God can do anything. Perhaps God will provide us victory, you and me, against who knows how many men that we're going to encounter as we come over this. And we see something here. It's very specific. Commentators note there is there is something here that is not optimism. There's something. Who here generally thinks they're optimistic? Yes, I'm going to look at the bright side of the situation. Things will turn out okay. That's not a bad disposition, but it's very different from faith. We see that Jonathan is not just, well, I, I'm just going to look on the bright side. I'm going to assume things will turn out to the best. That's not faith. Faith is actually trusting that there is a God. Perhaps God will provide. Perhaps God, this God that I love and trust can do absolutely anything. I'm going to move forward. Meanwhile, as we saw last week, Saul was actually instructed to wait seven days. And as his men began to desert, as he began to lose his soldiers, as they began to drift away, Saul, Jonathan's father, began to lose that faith, which tells us it wasn't in God, it was in his army of men. In fact, he should have known and forgot the story of Gideon and his 300 men which God had taken down an incredible army. Fear of desertion drives him to jump the gun and then do priestly duties he wasn't supposed to do. Samuel showed up and rebuked him. Pessimism got the better of Saul. Jonathan is more optimistic, but on top of that, he has faith. He's not just looking on the bright side. He says, perhaps God will act for us. And he says that word, perhaps, which is also very pivotal. Perhaps God will help us. Now, this is counter to some church theories today where we say, we say, name it and claim it. Right? If I name it, God has to give it to me. Well, but God is free. The way Jonathan approaches this, he's like, we're going to go up there. Perhaps God will give us victory. Jonathan, in doing this, he's confessing the power of Yahweh to do anything. But he's also, within that, proclaiming the freedom of God, the freedom of Yahweh. God is free. It's not, I'm faithful, so you owe me. I'm faithful, so you owe me victory. No, that, that's not the attitude. It's, I'm faithful to you, God, so you owe me success and health and everything in this life. That's not the attitude that Jonathan says. He's moving forward with optimism and confidence. What's the worst that happens if he falls in battle? He goes to be with God. Like, let's move forward. Perhaps God will give us victory. There's nothing wrong with that perhaps. There's nothing wrong with saying that as we move through this life. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but perhaps God will give me opportunity to share my faith. Perhaps God will give me an opportunity for success. Perhaps God will give me those opportunities. And I can move with a confidence that goes beyond optimism. Knowing that even if I fall flat on my face, even if the headlines are dark, 
I can still move forward with the confidence that I have in God. And that's really then the difference. That's, that's where faith bridges a middle between optimism, then there's faith, then there's arrogance. Right? And, and we cannot, I can't stand here as a Christian and say I've never fallen into a, I've never been susceptible to that. Well, I'm a Christian, I'm doing things right, so I'm, pretty, I'm guaranteed to walk into this situation and stumble and fall and screw up and uh, be harsh and, and sin when I should have done something other or, or be harsh when I should have been gentle. Right? There's an arrogance that comes into our faith if we think that I have God on my side I'm never going to fail. I'm never going to fail, but I'm never going to fail in what he wants, not necessarily the objective I'm after, even if it seems like a godly aim. And so some of us, we can go through life sitting in church and being very optimistic people, or being very arrogant people, but not having true faith. That's one of those things sometimes when I sift myself, is it really the fact that I believe in an eternity in God that gives me the confidence that carries me through my day? Or is it really just some sort of James bravado and arrogance? Or is it really just that I'm always chipper and always telling everybody to look on the bright side? Is it really faith? I like to say, like, where am I at when I wake up in the morning or if I'm praying? It's like, God, am I truly, is it a faith in God or am I just chipper or am I just arrogant? That's a good question we can all ask ourselves. It's a good question we can ask ourselves on those days where maybe we're caught in some arrogance. Now, wait a minute. Is this really faith that I have? Am I really walking in it in faith? Because faith does give us courage. Dale Davis says God can do mighty works with very small resources, and God may be glad to do it in this case. And as he's sort of giving his own paraphrase to what Jonathan's saying, he's saying, how can we know, dear armor-bearer, unless we place ourselves at his disposal? That's really the call we have as part of God's family. God can do mighty works. I don't know which times he's going to absolutely bless and bring out tremendous fruit. Sometimes you look out at the landscape, even in, we see places where the disciples would go and share the good news of Jesus, thousands would get saved. Other times, no one. God can do mighty works. We can try to jump alongside and very practically help somebody, but then find out, you know, the resources don't turn up. We're, we're only able to provide a very small bit of help. We wanted to provide a towering, a massive amount of help to just overwhelm them. Well, it didn't happen that time. I just put my hand to help somebody else. And that's okay. God can do amazing and mighty, miraculous things unless we are willing to walk into a situation and place ourselves at his disposal. We're never going to know if it's going to happen or not. Saul was told to wait and couldn't be patient. And now we see God is moving. The camp's thrown into a panic. The Philistines are kind of in chaos. Now is the time. Saul's been patient, or sorry, he's been impatient. He did what he shouldn't have done and offered some priestly duties. He got rebuked for it. Now he's looking for, is it time to move? Now we see in the scripture, Jonathan has riled up the camp, and God is starting to do an amazing thing. Let's see what Saul does then as we go into verse 16. And the watchman of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who's gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. The ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle. And behold, every Philistine's sword was against his fellow, and there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews, who had been with the Philistines before that time, and who had gone up with them into the camp, even though they turned to be with the Israelites, who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, when all the men of Israel, who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim, heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed beyond beth -Haven. Saul's rebuked, but then Samuel then left. We see then Jonathan is the one who is moving. God is using Jonathan to rout the Philistines. 
while Saul is sitting. And then finally, he's caught. Back then, he calls, he's like, well, let's uh, count the men again. Uh, no, call for the ark. Uh, okay, no, no, okay, now we're going to go follow them. Uh, it was interesting, I, I didn't get out to see the Peanuts movie this weekend, but I was thinking about how Charlie Brown is accused of being wishy-washy. And I told you we were going to see a stark contrast. I was thinking of the, uh, what, what's the image of Saul versus the image of Jonathan that comes into my brain when I'm thinking of this. <laughs> you know, we, we're told that Saul has at least three elements of folly as commentators look at this passage, which come in a line of follies. Opportunity knocks and Saul takes another count. And then he calls for the ark and then he has the priest Start, he has the priest begin some duties, but then, uh, no, no, stop in the middle of it. No, I'm going another direction now. He's just, he's sort of going every which way, and then he, you know, fortunately, the coattails of Jonathan and what God has done through him, he and then all of the people are able to come on and rout the Philistines. But he calls for the ark, and then he changes his mind. One, one commentator David Samura says, Saul treats both the divine object and the divine method rather carelessly. I go, what am I going to do? Uh, okay, I br bring on the religious, uh, bring on the religious hacks. Maybe that'll solve some things. Now, most of us aren't dealing with kingships or arcs or priests, but I think we can connect here. Sometimes. We are so far from walking in a life that is prayerful and interactive with God. It's only when the trouble really gets to a certain point and we're really confused and we're really desperate. And it's like, oh, I'm going to start doing the prayer thing and I'm going to go to church again and I'm going to do it. Like, we start doing the acts to try to get back the insurance of the direction. And sometimes we just do that rather recklessly or carelessly. Or sometimes then we get back into that arrogance mode, don't we? Saul does not inquire of the priest. He commands the priest. They, they're not supposed to be, just as our government has checks and balances. He commands instead of inquires. And then at a crucial moment, he just interrupts the priest's consultation. No, withdraw your hand. Wh whatever. No, I tried this. We're, we're going another direction now. Samar so says, Saul is a man who prays when he should act and acts when he should pray. And that might be stern for some of you. I, if that feels stern, well, it is. And this is why God says we need to be seeking him in prayer for wisdom and discernment. And in our decision making, we need to seek out people who are trustworthy and respectable and seek an abundance of counsel as we look toward making a decision. The godly discernment can be given. We don't have to be like Saul, doing the one thing when we should be doing the other, and then vice versa. Caught a, in, impatient, uh, impatient when we should be waiting, and then dallying when we should be acting. And so, fortunately, because of Jonathan, there's a chance for success, not just success, but sweet success. And what does Saul do then? He turns to sour, as we continue in verse 24. It says, the men of Israel have been hard-pressed that day. So Saul had laid an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I, I am avenged on my enemies. So none of the people had tasted food. Now when all the people came to the forest, behold, there was honey on the ground. Or candy on the seats. <laughs> and when the people entered the forest, behold, the honey was dropping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath, so he put the tip of the staff that was in his hand, dipped it in the honeycomb, and put the hand to his mouth, and his eyes became bright. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. Then Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies that they found. For now the defeat among the Philistines has not been great. Saul's folly is strike two. It says, and the people were faint. 
Yeah. Because here, God's routed the people, their enemies. They could chase and have great victory, but Saul's making them do it all starving. They were hard-pressed that day. Yeah, you think? I work on my computer all day and don't have food. I get, what is it, hangry? People were hard-pressed that day. Because, not because God called them to a heavy task and they were exhausted, but because their human king took what God had given them and made it extra heavy. Saul tries to be holy, makes a really bad call. Matthew Henry, in his commentary, said, For if it gained time, right, we're not stopping to eat food, we're not going, you know, not stopping for the drive through and then continuing on. For if it gained time, it lost strength in pursuit. To forbid them to feast would have been commendable. To forbid them to feast, like, okay, let's have a big table in Turkey, we'll sit down for a few hours, Philistines just keep moving away in the distance, see the dust. But to forbid them to taste, though ever so hungry, was barbarous. Saul imposes a fast upon the army in an attempt, apparently, to influence Yahweh, influence God, by a grandiose gesture of self-denial. Give us, give us victory, which seemed to already be transpired. Give us great victory, God, because I am so pious. I have a men's morning prayer. One of our uh, members was explaining to me how to sound extra pious, the way you kind of drop that last bit of the tone. For I'm ever so pious. <laughs> if you guys want to learn how to, if you get to learn that, just talk to Dr. Bob. Um, <laughs> now, a good leader won't say, sacrifice all of you, let's sacrifice exactly like me, in every portion and in every direction. A good leader would say, everyone sacrifice as you are able, be inspired by that, here are a variety of directions. That's a leader. As we look at this, we invite people to serve through a variety of ways. Here's someone that needs help. Give what you are able. Here is some children who could be blessed. Maybe you could provide one or ten shoeboxes. Sacrifice, yes, the call to sacrifice is what a leader calls. Demanding portions, particularly when it hasn't come from godly discernment in any manner, way, shape, or form, but even as he says, well, whose victory does he call it? God's victory? If you look back in the text, he says, my enemies, my victory. My vengeance. Saul doesn't have the right heart, and Jonathan rightly says, My father, my father has troubled the land. And how's their, you know, they are routing the Philistines. There is a victory. It could have been a tremendous victory. It could have been a great victory. And what's Jonathan's term for it? They're not great. In fact, his language that he uses there in Scripture. It echoes, it echoes scripture at the time of Joshua, when a man named Achan had actually sinned and gone against God, and his sin brought trouble on the entire camp, on all of Israel. It's the exact same, le Jonathan's using the same language, so he's not explicitly saying Saul, he's not by word calling out Saul's sin, but the implication is there. Like, this wasn't even just a bad call, this was from a sinful heart that's not rightly disposed toward God. As David Sumero would say, while Saul was stubbornly, stubbornly religious, Jonathan was, by contrast, practically God-fearing. The Philistine campaign could have been great. Now it's not so great. And then, it gets worse. They struck down the Philistines that day, in verse 31, from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. The people pounced on the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. And they told Saul, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he said, You've dealt treacherously. Roll a great stone to me here. And Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Let every man bring his ox or his sheep and slaughter them here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. 
So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night, and they slaughtered them there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time, the first altar that he'd built to the Lord. Oh boy. Saul. Now the people we see have gone from Saul's legalism to legitimate sin. They were given strict instructions as to how they were to eat meat by God. And yet, now we see they are breaking real laws of God. And what does Saul do? Does Saul say, wow, I starved them. That wasn't helpful. And even if they're responsible for their own sin, I really put up some great stumbling blocks for them. I am either, if not fully responsible as king, I'll admit some culpability. Nope. That is not what Saul does. He says, oh, these sinful people, look, I'm going to build an altar. Look how pious I am. Now come and repent. Now, the people are responsible for their own sin. Don't get me wrong. Somebody, gets, somebody sins, that's between them and God. Then and today. But as a leader, he should have led in repentance. He should have led with repentance. And we see now he starts to lose trust with his people. He starts to lose trust with his people. Continues on. In verse 36, Saul said, Let us go down to the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. Let us not leave a man to them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. But the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. And Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he, God, did not answer him, Saul, in that day. And Saul said, Come here, all you leaders of the people, and know and see how this sin has arisen today. Not only is he losing the trust of the people, what's God's response to him when he inquires? No answer. No answer. And here's the interesting question I have. But did he ask, did he ask in a relationship with God, or did he ask as a last resort to get what he wanted? The priest says, let's stay with God here. Saul's inquiring, God, what do you want? No answer. Saul inquires, shall I go down after the Philistines? No answer from God. I built you an altar. Right, that's got to hurt. I'm doing all the right stuff. Why won't you answer, God? A question for Saul and us when we reach out to God and inquire and get frustrated because we don't feel like he's giving us discernment, clarity, or an answer. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, was it my last resort? Was God my last resort? Do I have a relationship with him, or do I just go to ask him when I really want something? Saul, of course, goes for strike three in his folly, and he's determined to ferret out who's responsible for these problems. In verse 38, Saul says, let us go down after the Philistines by night, plunder them. They say, do whatever you want. The priest says, let us draw near to God. So Saul goes on. He says, come here, all you leaders of the people. Know and see how the sin has arisen today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel... Though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people who answered him. Then he said to all Israel, You shall be on one side. I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, Do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said, O Lord God of Israel, why have you not answered your servant this day? If this guilt is in me or in Jonathan my son, O Lord God of Israel, give Urim. But if this guilt is in your people Israel, give Thummim. And Jonathan and Saul were taken, but the people escaped. Then Saul said, cast the lot between me and my son Jonathan. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I will die. And Saul said, God do so to me and more also, you shall surely die, Jonathan. Then the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it, as the Lord lives, there shall not be one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan, so that he did not die. Then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines. The Philistines went to their own, own place. 
Though it be Jonathan my son. Oh, how ironic. Because he doesn't know yet when he says that. And then Jonathan says to him, the translators actually wonder if Jonathan is saying willingly, I must die. Or whether that's actually the kind of thing where he's saying, I must die? Seriously? Really? Now Saul has a chance to repent here. His son has been exposed, breaking the rash vow Saul made. He has a chance to repent or at least lament. One of God's judges in earlier passages of Scripture makes a rash vow. He says, whatever comes through that door next, I'll sacrifice to God. And his daughter walks through. And his response is to lament. Do we even see Saul? He's just like, surely you will die. I don't see sackcloth or ashes or anything that looks like lamentation. Is he that pious and full of himself? You shall surely die, Jonathan. And yet we see later in scriptures that talk about David, there is precedent. When an oath was made to, some, to sin, when an oath was made to something that was not of God, there was precedent that that oath could be broken. But Saul isn't even going to take that kind of out. He says his son's going to die. The guy who on one hand plays it fast and loose with God's laws as it suits him isn't going to do it with his own vow regarding his own son. Richard Phillips says the soldiers had done their best to obey Saul's foolish commands, but there were limits to what he could demand of them. They would not stand for Jonathan's execution. People are not going to take Saul anymore. And so they ransom Jonathan. But as they, their declaration is a vow. So then Saul is the king. He's like, all right, they've made a vow to God. I made a vow to God. Which, you know, who's going to fold? You know, they're playing chicken. There's vows coming at each other. Somebody has to yield. Saul has to eat his own vow, and he caves. Because the people we see clearly love and recognize the faith and victory and the way God has used Jonathan. And some commentators have even asked, why not Jonathan? Why couldn't Jonathan have replaced Saul as king? Saul's unworthy. Why, God, couldn't you have just taken, why couldn't Saul have been taken down and Jonathan become the next king? We see he goes on to be fa a faithful friend to David later in Scripture. Why does he only get, as some commentators allude and compare, almost he gets to play almost a John the Baptist role to set up and, and set up David? As John the Baptist precedes Jesus. Why did Jonathan have to be eliminated and, 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 as the story is told, actually perishes alongside his father? Why does God work this way? We see generational consequences on sons and grandsons, etc., throughout Scripture. And we come from such an individualistic culture, sometimes it's really hard for us to grasp or understand or feel like it's fair that God works that way. Because of, because of Saul, God won't let Jonathan reach his true potential? He's going to just be, at best, he's going to be Samwise to David's Frodo? He's going to die alongside his father? And that really brings one of those challenging questions that has to come to us as we walk through this life and what we encounter in this life is self-fulfillment fulfillment in this life, self-actualization. Is it a right? Is it something that God owes me? Is life about my own personal self-fulfillment, or is it about being a player in God's story? That's huge, because not everybody is going to get to be the main hero of their generation. Not everybody is going to get to be the center stage. Not everyone wants to be, let's face it, most of us want to be kind of the hero of our own stories. Everyone wants to be the center of their own universe. And the good news of the gospel already has a reality check we need to cash, and that is that the universe is not mine. And the story is not mine. Dale Davis said in regard to this and the life of Jonathan, maybe a tragic life isn't tragic if it's lived in fidelity to what Christ asks of us in the circumstances that he gives us. Not only for all of us in our own course, but as we're called into community and some are called to leadership. A soul we see casually employs God for his own ends. He casually employs God for what Saul wants to do. That's one of those questions and admonitions for us, too. Are we seeking God daily toward our own ends? Or are we truly seeking God to be a means to his ends? It's far more humbling. It means I might defer certain desires in my life. 
It means I might defer certain courses of action in my life. It means I might sacrifice things I might like to use just for my own personal gain. And as Jonathan basically tells his armor bearer, and how are we to know even if we're not even looking for opportunities and putting ourselves at his disposal? Perhaps God will work something through us this day. Do we operate from that faith? We operate from a faith that is different from optimism and does not go over the line into arrogance. That's our test. But we have this beautiful picture here, even though it's in the midst of craziness, even though there's so much chaos going on in this story, there's very clearly this chapter's act in which we see Jonathan finds himself under a curse from an earthly father. Because of what Saul, his father, has done, he then eats some honey. He tastes something sweet, dripping from God's creation, and finds himself under a curse from an earthly father. Jonathan, though, we see in his life, is putting his faith and his trust in his heavenly father. And as we see God working through the hearts of his people in this situation, Jonathan is ransomed from death and freed from from that curse and its effects. Jonathan, although maybe could have been a spectacular king, has a different place in God's story. Jonathan precedes David, who will become God's king, the man after God's own heart. In Scripture, we see men of God, like John the Baptist, have beautiful moments even of preceding the ultimate Messiah, Jesus proclaiming him the ultimate king. See, Jonathan retains a place of honor in God's story. His father Saul retains no such honor. We see in this passage, Saul led others into temptation, led them into a place where they were starving, so starving that then, by their own choice and responsibility as well, they just start breaking God's laws and eating and treating meat and their food in ways that God asked them not to. And what does Saul do then? Multiple times, he tries to blame Shem. Sometimes we are to manipulate God, sort of find ourselves in a place where we want to impose grand ritual above and beyond Scripture, those grandiose acts of self-denial, fasting, and then maybe you know, boasting about how we're fasting in front of everyone. Who does Saul remind me of in this passage? Maybe some of you too. Reminds me of the Pharisees. Reminds me of the Pharisees. In fact, we'll see them encounter Jesus in the Gospels, and they accuse Jesus of doing things. Your, your, your disciples you know, ate and plucked things. They, they broke the Sabbath. And Jesus would say, yes, they're breaking all of the extra rules that you have put on top of to define Sabbath conduct. But like Saul, it's like these are rules you're putting on top of God's rules to increase your own ways to evidence your own piety and to force people into doing things exactly like you are. Richard Phillips would say the people of God are to be led by true biblical convictions expressed with consistency and expressed with a passionate and principled faith. And this goes doubly for leaders. There are principles that we can all take to apply to our hearts in this today. Places where, like Saul, we can all fall, but particularly those who called into leadership, practical, maybe in business, particularly in the church. Richard Phillips says, who does not see what a fearful thing it is to leave God in his ways and give oneself up to the impulses of one's heart? Fearful for even the humblest of us, but infinitely fearful for one of great resources and influence with a whole people under him. Let us fear indeed that such a calamity should befall us, our families, or our churches. And instead, Richard Phillips says, let the wisdom of the Psalms speak the desire of our hearts. I invite you, as we close, Saul was far from truly understanding or seeking God's counsel. Jonathan was willing to walk forward in faith, look for God's informing of his heart and soul and mind. And so, you're all welcome, of course, to eat the little candy on the seat. But hopefully, you'll join me in reciting what I think is a sweet passage from the Psalms 
as we close together today and go into a time of response and offering as well. Let's say this verse together. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I will Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. God's people said, Amen. Father, we thank you today that we can learn from the faith of Jonathan and the folly of Saul. God, that we would not seek to avoid responsibility, culpability, the way that our sin not only stains us, but many times ripples out, affects, impacts, inspires others to do the same things or worse things. God, that we're not islands with just such an individual relationship to you that our actions don't impact and ripple into the lives of others. And so I pray we would seek your godly discernment. I pray that we would seek to be instruments of faith, active faith, like Jonathan, that could enjoy how incredibly sweet you are, and also then look to you for wisdom, counsel, discernment. I pray that we could, we could be a people that would see injustice like the people see in Saul, and actually declare, no, there needs to be God's heart, and God's justice, and God's grace to situations like we see. May we be a congregation who, like your people in this instance, saw clearly when the harsh discipline needed to not be given. May God help us in community to walk with one another in such a way to pull people out of being wrongfully punished, to also guide and correct those who need it, but always by your discernment, by your wisdom, and with the knowledge that faith in you is ever and truly sweet. In your